This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Jonathan, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me back. Glad to have you back. Now, folks, we're going to be talking about Kamala Harris's price gouging proposal and specifically some heterodox economist attempts to say, oh, 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 everybody knows price controls work nowadays. Don't listen to those fuddy-duddy economists who are telling you otherwise. But before we do that, let me just remind you, at this point, you've got one week left to snag your free copy of Dr. Parabylan's Primer on Economics, How to Think About the Economy. This short book teaches sound economic reasoning and is a perfect introduction for friends and family to proper economic literacy. You can get your free copy of Pear's book, How to Think About the Economy, by visiting Mises.org slash H-A pod free. That's Mises.org slash H-A-P-O-D-F-R-E-E. Again, you've only got one week, so act now to get your free copy. Now, except for Pear's book, Jonathan, in general, free things lead to shortages. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. As everybody knows at this point, Kamala Harris recently proposed measures to crack down on price gouging. Now, if you go to her website, it's very scant on details. And I guess if you don't say anything, nobody can prove you wrong. Uh, but I think you know maybe we'll start here just in case people have not been in the loop, Jonathan, just to give your general reactions. And then, as I say, folks, we have a specific article that what I want to do in terms of the meat of this episode is go into like the next layer where some professional economists have come back swinging and said, oh, no, no, this Econ 101 complaints about price controls are misguided. And, you know, the real sophisticates know that government price controls can work, at least under certain circumstances. So we'll address that in a moment. But first, let's just, you know, hit the low hanging fruit here, Jonathan. What's what's the problem with price controls? Why, why shouldn't we be applaud if a political candidate says she's going to crack down on price gouging. Isn't that a good idea? Well, what's interesting is that, so you're right, that she was very vague in her proposal. I think it was just like a couple sentences in some speech that she gave. And it was basically just, we're going to uh, crack down on price gouging. And then the response from econ- some economists and some commentators was, this is not the same thing as price controls. It's, it's just a ban on price gouging. Um, and so that, that's at least one interesting thing that's going on here is sort of like this wordplay that they're trying to they're trying to claim that she's not actually proposing price controls. But then, as you mentioned in the article that we're going to look at and, and some other articles, they're saying, but actually price controls are a good idea. So <laughs> it's it's like this weird it's this weird thing where they're saying she's not actually proposing price controls, but hey, price controls are a good idea. Uh, when, of course, a ban on price gouging is a price control. Um, so a lot of times people actually, can I just jump in for a second? Sure, it's, sure. I didn't even, you're right. I'm, as you were saying that I realized, oh yeah, he's right. Like it hadn't even as obvious that it hadn't hit me. And you're, it's kind of like how the progressives were responding to the charges of inflation at first. Like, no, no, it's not happening. What are you talking about? And then it was, this is actually a good thing. It redistributes money from the wealthy to the, uh, the, the workers. And so this is actually a good thing, you know, and it is that, that gaslighting and then flipping it. And then what are you talking about? This is fine. The other interesting thing about it is that it's there's the, there's this new fascination with grocery stores uh, on the progressive left. Uh, for some reason, they've they've pinpointed them. I think it's probably because they're an easy scapegoat. So a lot of people see the rising prices uh, in, in the stores that they go to, and of course, we all go to the grocery store pretty frequently. Um, and so it's it's easy to to blame them as like a very proximate. Uh, the owners of the grocery store, it's very easy to blame them as like a very proximate cause of higher prices, um, e- even though we understand that inflation has other causes and, in fact, isn't even defined by uh, increased uh, prices. Uh, so it, it, what, what's strange about the fact that they've they've all sort of gathered around grocery stores and they're vilifying them is that grocery stores, th- there's plenty of competition. Uh, their Their margins are very low. And so it's it seems strange that they would you know accuse them of being these greedy price gouging profiteers who are, who are just trying to exploit uh, some crisis. I'm not sure what because usually a price gouging legislation takes takes effect when uh, there's some sort of emergency or some sort of crisis. Like the typical uh, example is a hurricane or tornado or earthquake or something like that, where the the prices of some necessities will increase a lot, and so governments. Uh, state governments have these price gouging laws in effect to prevent them from going up too high. 
which by the way makes them a price control because it's a it's a limit on on the movement of prices. Uh, but what's weird about this case is that there's not a crisis and they've and they've sort of converged on grocery stores for whatever reason. I think it's it's for political reasons. They they realize that it's it's an easy case to make because in the in the progressive narrative of the way things work, uh, it's all all price increases. Anything that's bad for the consumer must be good for some producer somewhere, some seller. And so if they can just you know pin the blame on the, the grocery store owners, then they can count that as a political win. Yeah, and again, I'm just, you're right, Jonathan, that it's, for those who have been paying attention to this stuff, ever since Joe Biden came in, people on the right have been complaining, or, you know, just for average Americans about prices at the grocery store, the typical progressive leftist has been poo-pooing that and saying, oh, no, no, don't listen, you know, these right-wing blowhards talk about how expensive eggs are, Here, here's a chart showing, and they would just keep downplaying and gaslighting that, no, this is all in your head, and so if we can flash a chart here, you can see using the government's own statistics that you can see that the food at home component of the CPI, this is year over year increases, maxed at 13.5% back in August of 2022. And that year over year increase was the highest going back to 1979. All right. So it's not uh, some right wing myth that the food at home price index, you know, has skyrocketed. And even there, I would argue that's downplaying the actual impact. Like, for example, you know, heaven help you if you want to go into a grocery store nowadays and have an employee help you do something, you know, <laughs> including checking out your bags at the end. That, that's gone. Uh, and so, you know, I can tell my kid, back in my day, there were employees that would actually bag your groceries. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, you know, so, so there's that element. I, you know, I've been talking about this for years, that the, the cereal box, you know, the cardboard's much thinner now. The quality of the toilet paper and the paper towels has degraded over time. You know, so there's lots of techniques that the manufacturers are using to not just merely pass through you know the, the spike in their input prices. You know, in terms of the raw commodities. So there's that element, and I think this you know these BLS statistics are, are overlooking that. But again, even on the official government statistics, the price hikes in grocery stores in recent past is the most it's been in decades. All right, so, th so there's that element. And then when we talk about, you know, what caused it here, we'll flash up another chart. You can see here, we're looking at the level of that food at home CPI index compared to the M2 money stock. And you can see, you know, they're not a perfect one-to-one -on -one -one mapping, but they generally follow each other. And also the contours are the same, that right after the lockdowns get imposed, the Fed dumps boatloads of money in, which fed through into the M2 money stock. And that skyrockets, and that's with a slight lag. That's exactly when the food at home price index started soaring. And then on the tail end, also the behavior was similar. That when the Fed finally slammed the brakes, M2 growth not only tapered off, but actually started gently declining. And then you see a similar pattern with the food at home price level, that it stopped rising so rapidly. And then his, you know, it's still gently trending upward, but it's not nearly the rapid increase that we saw before. So to say, why have things gotten so much more expensive at the grocery store to say the money supply has a lot to do with it is a much better explanation than blaming corporate greed, because why is it that the grocery stores got so greedy in August of 2022 and thereabouts, and then backed off it and became a little bit more altruistic afterward? That doesn't really make sense. Whereas to point to the money stock is a much better explanation for the particulars. Any thoughts on that, Jonathan? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking, so I, I was talking about the political uh, side of things, like how they, they've tried to find this scapegoat that's proximate. It's easy for the public, the voting public to sort of latch on to. It's the greedy grocery store owners who are gouging us. When, I mean, it, it would also fit within the progressive narrative to put some blame on the big banks and the banking cartel in, in the Federal Reserve System. So uh, there's... At least they have some. They have. They still have some bit of, of, this questioning of uh, consolidation w within the financial sector. But they they seem to have this blind spot. <clears throat> excuse me, for the Federal Reserve and and the banking cartel that it represents. Uh, and so I think what that reveals the fact that they don't go after the Fed, the fact that they don't go after um, all of the expansionary monetary policy is because they realize that it's. It enables all of the government spending that they want, and so and the reason why they need to deflect the blame is because if the blame were 
correctly placed on the actual source of inflation, which is which is money printing, then then they would they would have to lose. They'd have to concede that battleground of we want as much government spending as possible. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think maybe you can disagree with it or you would disagree on some of this stuff, John. I almost think it's at least the rank and file and the people arguing on Twitter about these things. I think some of it is simply, oh, if the other side says something, then I reflexively disagree. And so since people on the right are complaining about the Fed and you got guys like Ron Paul wanting to end the Fed, that means the Fed must actually be a good thing. And, and that no, these people are just making stuff up. How, how do you feel about, do you think that's at all playing a role in this? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've totally bought into the whole tribal way yeah. of thinking about things. So we, we are in these political tribes and there's this, yeah, like you said, there's this uh, uh, reflexive sort of disagreement whenever somebody from the other side says something. I'm, sh- I'm sure that plays a big part in it. Yeah, because you could so, imagine, like, if it was a more orthodox, and like, maybe this was the case, like, in the 60s or something, I could easily imagine if you had more conservative economists getting trotted out, you know, like Herb Stein or something, you know, and they were they were lauding the virtues of the Federal Reserve and how it's expert management and blah, 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 and, and it, we, we got to raise, you know, interest rates now because in, to tamp inflation, you know, you know, workers' wages are pushing up, pre- and you could imagine, well, you do see some of that where they're complaining, but again, they're, they're objecting to the specific policies of the Fed saying, you know, oh, they're being too much of inflationary hawks. They're not objecting to its existence per se, but you're right. Like why, if you think powerful people want to run the world, you would think the last thing is to create this engine of inflation that's going to be in practice controlled by the powerful people, not by, uh, you know, parents groups out of the inner city. Yeah. The only criticism of the Fed that I see from the left is that, so they, they are very mad whenever interest rates are increasing and they're always arguing for interest rates to decrease. So like their their goal is just as much inflation, lower interest rates, um, prop up the economy, you know, uh, push a bunch of money into the economy that and that increases wages. So like they're, they're probably also thinking about it in terms of the Phillips curve that uh, so since they are very uh, focused on employment and wages, then they're going to think that if we inflate more, if we have more expansion in monetary policy, then we can increase wages, increase employment. Uh, and, you know, the other side of that, the inflation will just sort of downplay it or will deflect blame to corporate greed, consolidation, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Just to give a quick example from the other side to show, you know, that I'm not just beating up on progressives. I noticed this back in the day, I did a lot of work, folks, uh, for an energy think tank, the Institute for Energy Research, and where I was like hip deep in the climate change policy debate. And there was this one time where... Um, I forget the, the the exact year or whatever, but it was during the Obama administration and people were pushing for the federal government to grant more leases for, you know, oil companies to drill on federally controlled lands to, to look for oil. You know, this was a period when, when crude oil prices were high and gasoline prices were relatively high. And so this would be an obvious policy response that, hey, if the, if the government wants to do something, if the Obama administration wants to do something to help American families you know, people driving to work, blah, blah, blah. You know, let's let's increase oil production from domestic sources. We don't have to rely on the Middle East, and, you know, that kind of thing. And Nancy Pelosi was going around and she, you know, she had some statistic and she was saying, no, no, no I oppose granting more uh, applications or permits to allow oil companies to drill exploratory wells. Because look at over the last blah, blah years, we've seen that um, of all the permits issued, they only develop, you know, working wells on, X percent of them. And it was, a very, I don't remember X was, but it was a low percentage. And so she's saying, so we, I oppose this. This wouldn't help, you know, this wouldn't increase oil production. And so the right, because Nancy Pelosi was saying that instinctively, you know, all of the other energy think tanks and whatever that were free market oriented, you know, Cato, they all dove it into we're arguing with her statistics and say, well, there's a reason the oil come. They're not stupid. It's because, you know, they don't know where the oil is going to be. And so they got to drill a lot of test. Way. And they were arguing. And I thought, guys, you're missing it. Just tell her, you're right, Nancy Pelosi. They're just going to pay money to the federal government and then not emit more carbon dioxide because they're not going to actually bring more oil to market. So why would you oppose that? Big oil handing over money to the Treasury and then not even emitting more CO2. 
Why are you against that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if somebody asked her that, you know, on, on, during a congressional testimony or hearings or something, like I think she would have been caught flat footed and that would have been hilarious. But again, nobody did that because there's this reflexive thing was, no, no, if Nancy Pelosi is saying something, we got to disagree with every, you know, even sub clause of her sentences instead of just saying, okay, if that's true, why are you against the policy? <laughs> you know, so anyway, that just was an example that, and I couldn't, you know, I was doing it in my own little lane, but in general, you know, quote, my side was mostly just a tech. Now, it, again, they were they were saying true things. They were showing her, you know, or, or the people who were listening to her, you know, they were explaining why that statistic was the way it was. And the oil companies obviously aren't just paying money to not do something with the permits. But anyway, it just I thought that was a great example where it was like, guys, let's, you know, you don't need to reflexively disagree with every sentence coming out of their mouth. <laughs> you can spin it, so... I would have asked Pelosi, uh, how long have you gone without your uh, the remote control for your TV? <laughs> so the the idea thing, you lose the remote control, but you know you've got to look in ten different places. You're only going to find it in one of those places. Therefore, we're just not going to look. We're not going to look for the remote control. I'm glad you spelled that out because I didn't know where you were going with that analogy. <laughs> that was just the first thing that came to mind. So we would never look for anything. We would never explore for anything since there's this low probability of finding it in one particular spot. No. <laughs> Take Sorry. that, Nancy <laughs> Pelosi. Yeah, yeah. She definitely would have been flummoxed if you had asked her that, I'm sure. She'd be, what? Well, I flummoxed you, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe before moving on here, let's just do the obvious stuff with the price. So you're right, Jonathan, that and that, that's how some people are trying to defend this stuff from Kamala Harris is to say, this is just federalizing what's already on the state books, and it's not like we have food shortages and it's, you know, uh, Stalinist Russia starving Ukrainians the way some of you right wing nut jobs are blah blah blah, and okay, even on its own terms though, yeah, those state level bans on so called price gouging in the case of natural disasters are a bad thing. All right, so just you know, real, real quick, uh, if there's a hurricane coming and it's some you know coastal town that's in the path of the hurricane and people are trying to flee, left to its own devices, the unfettered free market gasoline prices in that coastal town would spike. Right, because you know the demand would suddenly increase, and there's not enough time. If you know if the hurricane's just one day away to to ship in all kinds of new supply, and so yet the, maybe the price would jump from three fifty a gallon to ten dollars a gallon or something. Again, left you know in a genuinely free society where the people running the gas stations weren't worried about the attorney general cracking down on them after the fact. Okay, and so that's actually socially useful. You want prices to be able to do that to communicate the relevant information to everybody so they can make informed decisions. And the analogy I use is imagine if you're a, a base commander, you know, for a military outpost that's also in that region and you see the hurricane coming and your orders come down from on high saying, hey, get as many vehicles and personnel out of there as possible. And you've only got limited stocks of gasoline on the base. What would you do? You wouldn't have all the Jeeps line up and then fill the first few in line up to the brink and then have them go because then the rest of them would be stuck. Instead, you would probably do something like say, okay, you know, you'd ask your supports, where's the nearest refilling depot or whatever? And they would say, oh yeah, it's you know 70 miles inland. Okay. Any vehicle right now on base that has enough in its tank to reach that, you go, you know, load up with people, get out of here. And then of the remaining vehicles, how much do we have to put in each one so you can get to that next base? And that's the bare minimum we're going to give you to spread the available stockpile of gasoline on hand around to get as many vehicles out of here as possible. And so that's the general pattern you would use if you were like a top-down central planner. And notice the pattern of that is what happens in a decentralized market economy when you let prices do their job, right? Someone's got half a tank of gas. They're trying to get out of town. The hurricane's coming. They drive to the local gas station on their way out and it's $10 a gallon, they might be outraged, but you know what? They're not going to stop and fill up. They're going to keep driving. So you know what? Let's get on the interstate. Let's drive for an hour or two and see if the prices come down, and then we'll pull off and, and fill up that. Whereas the people that were running on fumes, they just, you know, when the news broke of the hurricane, they happened to just have, you know, they were, they were on E. They're going to need to get some gas before they get on the interstate, but they're not going to fill up when it's $10 a gallon. They're only going to put in a few gallons. They're going to do the math and think, okay, you know, I know there's a, a big exit. 50 miles north of here. And so let me just put in a few gallons to get up there. And hopefully the price is a lot lower than $10 up there, right? So again, it just causes people to economize, which is exactly what you want. Or if it's bottled water or tuna fish or what, toilet paper, by letting stores charge, quote, unconscionable prices, one of the things that accomplishes is 
the first few people who get to the store can't clean the shelves out to go stock their pantry, even though really there's only going to be like a 48 hour window when nobody can get you know supplies from the outside world. So there's that. And then the flip side, you want those high prices as a magnet to allow people in the surrounding areas to funnel in stockpiles, you know, batteries, flashlights, bottled water, what have you. If the price is allowed to spike temporarily, then people will figure out ways to get those commodities into the people who really need it. Whereas if the attorney general has the standing rule and everybody knows, oh yeah, if you filled up your pickup truck with cases of bottled water and drove it in there and started selling it to people for $5 a bottle, someone's going to take a photo of your license plate and you're going to get charged with something or fined down the road. Well, then you're going to just express thoughts and prayers while you're scrolling social media and feel bad for you. You're not going to load up your truck with cases of bottled water if you're not allowed to charge more than, quote, the normal price. So, you know, I get people can lament that and say everybody should be doing the best they can to help somebody who's in trouble without getting compensation. But, you know, at any given time, there's lots of people around the world that could use your help and market prices help coordinate. It doesn't mean everybody is totally selfish and greedy and only does that which serves the bottom line, but prices are definitely necessary to help people coordinate. And uh, cracking down on price gouging, even the state level versions of that, actually hampers the market economy's ability to help people during a crisis. During a crisis, when it's really important that market prices can serve their job. Any thoughts on that, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, this this is basic economics. And it's interesting that one of the uh, uh, articles that came up after Harris made this vague proposal was uh, the the title of I think it was the one that was at the Atlantic it was that sometimes you have to ignore the economists yeah and yeah. so it's like I mean this is it's very straightforward I don't know how many times I've heard the that explanation that you've given uh, it's it seems incontrovertible it's it's rock solid uh, and yet this is the sort of thinking this is the sort of you know and it's it's not even um, it's not even that difficult to follow I mean it ju- it just makes sense that that when we have this this scarcity, especially in a crisis, then what we want and what we need uh, in order for us to economize the use of this resource is for the, the price to increase, and that tells everybody, hey, I'm gonna I'm not gonna use as much as I would have if uh, the price were lower. And like you said, it attracts new supply to that same area. This is exactly what we want. So so if something is in short supply, we want people to conserve it, and we want more supply to come to that area. So. So it's almost it's a sort of uh, it's frustrating that we, that economists keep having to go through this this sort of thing to explain to people no price controls are a bad idea price gouging it might be uh, like emotionally or ethically there's things that you could say about like you don't want to see some some person really try to exploit and take advantage of people in this sort of crisis situation. But the fact of the matter is that the consequences of allowing prices to rise have all of these, these nice benefits and to, and to ignore what the economists have to say, to ignore this, this economic theory uh, means that you're, you're going to have all these sorts of bad outcomes where Mm -hmm. uh, more shortages uh, uh, you're not going to economize the good in question and so on and so forth. Um, Not only is the theory Correct and rock solid, but there's also there's this uh, book. Uh, I believe the title is "A uh, Forty Centuries of Price Controls" or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And and the authors go through, like the title suggests, many centuries, millennia of a, a times where governments try to implement price controls, and every single time you get you get the results that economic theory would predict. You get the shortages. You get the uh, the a waste of resources. You get black markets. You get all all, all those sorts of problems. Um, and so, in in one of my articles that I wrote in response to this, I I just picked out one of those historical examples of of the Roman Emperor Diocletian implementing price controls, uh, price ceilings on one thousand over one thousand two hundred goods. Uh, and then I found this philosopher that was reflecting on that. Uh, he did not have a lot of nice things to say about Diocletian, uh, but. In in his uh, in his writing, he, it was almost like it was an economics textbook, but but this was written in like 320 A.D., uh, where mm-hmm. he's talking about the scarcity, where he's talking about all the crackdown on the price gouging, that there was a lot of bloodshed involved. Uh, it, so and it led to the decline of the of the empire, decline of the of the area, and so it's it's something that the historical record bears out, economic theory bears out. And yet we just can't shake it. We, we can't, we yeah. can't, you know, finally annihilate this, this fallacy. 
Yeah, that was actually one of my favorite parts of Human Action, where Mises is, is talking about the fall of Rome, and he just casually mentions that yeah, it was the one-two punch of they, you know, they first debased the currency. You know that term debasement, folks, remember because back when coins had precious metal content, if you would melt them down and then add a baser metal and then recoin them, that was effectively, you know, you get more coins for a given amount of gold or silver. And so that's what the Roman emperors would do back then as a way of, uh, you know, getting more purchasing power temporarily and, you know, defrauding their citizens or subjects. And so, yeah, they would debase the currency. What would be the natural consequences? Well, the prices in the market and the markets for the goods that the people bought would tend to rise as, you know, more coins are floating around now. And then the ruler, instead of saying, oh, maybe I should stop debasing the currency because look at the impact, was, ah, I can't believe these greedy merchants are exploiting my people. You can't do that. I'll chop your hand off or chop your head off. And so, of course, what are the merchants going to do? If your costs of production are going up and you're not allowed to at least break even because the you know emperor is saying you're going to be punished, you're not going to operate at a loss indefinitely. You're just going to stop doing that. And so, and Mises was saying, so that's what happened in the cities. All of a sudden, the people you know, the food distribution network broke down. And so they had to flee and go out into the countryside. And Mises ties it to saying, that's why, you know, it's like, oh, they fell because of barbarian invasions. And Mises' point was, but Rome had been attacked, you know, plenty of times going back in its history and they always repelled them with no problem. Why was it that this time, you know, they succumbed? And he said, it's partly because the Roman, you know, the people welcomed these so-called barbarians with open arms because they were starving and they, you know, their life had broken down because of these crazy policies from the emperor. And so again, Mises is just saying, you know, this isn't just a matter of, wow, GDP growth fell 2.6 percentage point. Like, no, it's, this really, you know, explains major things. And then even something, you know, much more recent, I, I was just astonished, Jonathan, with Venezuela, similar thing, right? They pump in boatloads of money, the currency collapses, prices start skyrocketing. The socialist regime says, oh, no, no, These capitalist lapdogs and, you know, international currency speculators attacking us, blah, blah, blah. Stores can't charge more than such percent, you know, in increase per period. And the shelves all are empty of goods now. Again, textbook, what do you think is going to happen? And I was listening, I think it was NPR, a story in there. And they were blaming, Jonathan, the corruption of the military officials because they were supposed to be handing out emergency food supplies, and instead they were selling it for the higher prices on the black market. I was like, well, how come in most countries around the world right now, you don't rely on the military to be handing out food and toilet paper? Why is that? Is that just a coincidence? No, it's because they had massive inflation coupled with price controls. And then all of a sudden, you know, the stores stopped stocking the shelves. What, why would they continue to do that? And, uh, you know, people still don't seem to get that. I even interviewed a free market economist who was in Venezuela at the time, and I asked him, I said, surely like your colleagues know what's going on, right? And he was said, no, I mean, if they, you know, if they've had a background in Austrian economics or something, they do. But no, in general, no, nope, even the economists in Venezuela, or maybe they knew when they weren't saying it because they were afraid of getting in trouble. I don't know. But he was saying, no, publicly, it's not like even the economists in Venezuela knew. Yeah, this is textbook. When you have massive inflation coupled with price controls, don't be surprised to see shortages. And, and they just weren't. So like you say, Jonathan, it's kind of frustrating that this is really econ 101 stuff, and yet we're missing it. Yeah, one thing, uh, one thing that I noticed in the edict from Diocletian is that a lot of the arguments for the price controls that he makes, and, and there were you know some advisors that he inc included as authors of this edict. So one of the um, some of the the arguments in there are actually the same arguments that are being made by these uh, present day authors. I um, mean, this might be a good segue to talk about the uh, Galbraith and uh, Weber sure, yeah, article. Sure thing. Uh, and so it's not surprising because so many of them are pagans. But yeah. <laughs> so the the edict says that uh, prices increase even when there is a quote abundance of goods and a quote a bounty of good years. Uh, and in the Galbraith and Weber article, they are making the same sort of claim, but uh, they're focusing on egg production. So they're showing that, there, you know, mm -hmm. there's not really a connection between supply and prices uh, because we've seen in uh, cases where there's been an increase in egg production that prices also increase. And then I pointed out that neither Diocletian nor uh, Galbraith and Weber pointed out the – they. None, neither one of them said anything about the money as causing, you know, the increase right, in prices. Right, right. Uh, the the Atlantic article that I mentioned before said uh, price gouging laws represent a different set of market rules grounded in fairness. And of course, in Diocletian's edict, there's all sorts of appeals to justice and righteousness, fairness, public interest. So that's a very going back 
uh, over a thousand years, you see the same sort of argument. And then I also found a, um, a, a counterpart to Paul Krugman's claim where he was trying to say it's not price, it's not a price control, it's just a ban on price gouging. But in the edict, they say, we have taken the position not that we must set prices of goods and services for sale, but that we must set a limit. So <laughs> there's that same sort of mm-hmm. wordplay where they're right, trying right. to claim that we're not we're not setting prices, it's not price control, we're just setting a limit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so a lot of the arguments from hundreds thousands of years ago are being made today, uh, including the ones that we're uh, looking at in this Galbraith and Weber article. Yeah. So yeah, well, since you've introduced it, let me just give some more context. So specifically, for, again, w- what happened was Kamala Harris floats this idea of cracking down on price gouging because all of a sudden now the right wingers and Fox News you know, weren't lying when they said that prices really are rising rapidly at the grocery store. And, uh, and Kamala Harris is, you know, for some reason, corporations got a lot greedier under her boss's administration, and she didn't do anything about it as vice president all this time. But if we make her president, she's going to crack down on it. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, people on the right started freaking out about, hey, price controls, price ceilings lead to shortages. What are you doing? You want to turn us into Venezuela or Argentina, blah, blah, blah. And then there was this counter-counter response from some economically literate and savvy at least, you know, in terms of their credentials, um, progressives saying, oh, don't fall for this stuff. The, the right likes to tell people that this is Econ 101 when no things, maybe we need to move beyond intro classes, guys, right? So that was the, the smug take of a lot of people. So here, this is a piece in the Boston Globe. It ran on August 22nd, 2024, titled Harris's Fight Against Price Gouging is Good Economics. And the authors are James K. Galbraith and Isabella Weber. And the subtitle is, The idea that prices serve to balance supply and demand and should be left free to do so is bred in the bone of economists, so much so that facts barely matter. Okay, so they're going to come in and set us straight. And incidentally, let me just mention, I have a soft spot in my heart for James Galbraith because I don't know if this was on your radar, Jonathan, but when Thomas Piketty's book came out, and he and in and, and in the book he would Piketty was saying that the Cambridge Capital controversy was, you know, you don't need to worry about that. And and his summary of it was like he didn't even know what he was talking about. Like Wikipedia's entry was, was truly far more informative. And and Galbraith, you know, weighed in as a heterodox, you know, sort of post-Keynesian guy to say, What are you talking about? No, the Cambridge, you know, and so I as an Austria, like Galbraith and I was it was sort of like Compton and Long Beach were together on that one. And we and we were opposed. So anyway, I I'm, I was disappointed to see Galbraith was being a, a conventional leftist on this one. But having said that, let me just give folks a little bit of flavor of what happened here, and I'll respond. And then I know, Jonathan, you may have had some particular things you wanted to hit. So I'll, I'll just read the first couple paragraphs just so people get a sense. Former President Donald Trump has called Vice President Kamala Harris, quote, full communist for her attacks on price gouging. Jason Furman, a Harvard professor, says her anti-gouging proposals are not sensible. Big things are clearly at stake, the election and the very sanctity of textbook economics. The idea that prices serve to balance supply and demand and should be left free to do so is bred in the bone of economy. And bread, folks, is B-R-E-D, right? So they're saying, like, you're you're bred to think this. Um, So much so that facts barely matter. Thus, on August 15th, Furman told the New York Times, quote, egg prices went up last year. It's because there weren't as many eggs and it caused more egg production. Okay, and that's not, you know, that's not taken out of context. I went and checked that New York Times and so that is what he was saying, right? So again, what's happening here is Harvard economist Furman is, and by the way, he's not a right winger by any stretch, okay? But that's, that's the thing here is on some of these, that even conventional economists and some major media organs, including CNN, were coming out against this. And you know, maybe we can speculate at the tail end of this episode, Jonathan, as to why that is. That kind of surprised me. But for whatever reason, even some conventional left-wing sources came out against this stuff. And so Furman, among other things, this Harvard professor was saying, no, you want to have prices go up because that's what brings forth supply. For example, so he's speaking in, you know, right now, 2020, August 2024, and he said last year egg prices went up. And he said the reason because there weren't as many eggs and that caused more egg production, right? Meaning you want to let that happen so because that's what fixes the problem, right? That more eggs come to market if you let the price be higher. And so... uh, Galbraith and Weber are going to disagree with that. So let me just read that and then I'll uh, explain the problem with their response 
In fact, U.S. egg production peaked in 2019 and then fell slightly through last year. Egg prices spiked from early 2022 to $4.82 a dozen on average in January of 2023 before falling back again with no gain in production. High prices did not stimulate America's hens to greater effort. On these points, Furman laid an egg. Okay, so let's just pause there. So you see the rhetorical effect of what they're doing, right? And this is very typical in this thing where they, they contrast like the... Uh, the platitudes and truisms of conventional econ 101, but let's go look at the actual data and the actual facts to see whether it holds up, right? So this is very typical in how this works. And so from that, oh, gee, even on its own terms, though, they're not at all refuting what he said. He said egg production was down last year in 2023. That's why the prices were higher, and that brought forth more supply. And that's why it would have been a bad idea to crack down on higher egg prices last year because the supply response wouldn't have been as much. And so to allegedly disprove that, they're saying U.S. egg production peaked in 2019 and then fell slightly through last year. Okay, well, if you look at the actual chart, yeah, it went down and then it turned around and started going back up. Okay, and then the actual, the link that they're giving for this data, if you go and check it, I think we can flash it up on the screen here. You can see what I'm talking about, that yeah, it did peak in 2019 and then it was trending down and then it bottomed out and turned around going, you know, bottomed out in 2023 and started turning around, right? So that is entirely consistent with Furman's story. Furman wasn't saying higher prices last year meant production this year is higher than it was in 2019. No, there were a lot of things that happened between 2019 and now, including the COVID lockdowns and all sorts of other things going on and boatloads of money getting dumped in. Right, so that's not surprising. There could be other things, but Furman's point was production was down last year, right? So to say, oh no, but production was down last year, right? That's exactly what he said, and then it turned around. And the other thing that's funny about this is their own this own chart that they link to. If you read the fine print, it says data are as of November seventh, twenty twenty three. Okay, so <laughs> they're quoting Furman in August of twenty twenty four and saying, yeah, prices spiked last year. And that brought forth new supply. And they're saying, no, it didn't. Look at this source. And that source is accurate as of November 7th, 2023. Okay, so no, even on their own terms, they couldn't possibly be disproving him. But what's happening in that source is it's showing projections. And the projection was that production would turn around and rise going into 2024. Okay, so again, their own source, strictly speaking, couldn't possibly refute him because they don't know. But also the people doing the projections behind that source, what they said was entirely consistent with his narrative. And let me just say one last thing of this issue of, you know, their, their glib line about the higher, you know, prices didn't make hens produce more. That's so here, you know, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a city boy, well, suburban boy, but I did check with some people on Twitter. And my understanding is that for a given hen, it's not that the farmers, especially like in commercial industrial level organ, you know, operations, it's not that they wait until the hen has cranked out the very last egg, biologically speaking, that's going to come out of it. And then, you know, do they take it out of the production cycle and go do, you know, turn it into a stew or whatever they end up doing with it? That's not what happens, right? That there is some margin and plenty of people were chiming in, you know, who are in this business saying, yeah, it's a matter of you know, like feed prices. And yes, if feed prices were, you know, if egg prices rose more than feed price, you know, meaning like how much you got to feed the chickens or the hens to get them to keep laying eggs and whatnot. Yeah. If egg prices spiked more than feed prices on the margin, it would make sense to keep the hens laying eggs longer. Whereas in normal circumstances, you know, once the production starts tapering off, you get them out of the rhythm and you bring in, you know, younger hens to, to maximize, you know, the amount of eggs per animal per week or whatever. Okay. So it's not, you know, Furman's not saying something that's violating biology by saying if egg prices spike and he had a whole year for it to work, right? He wasn't saying within the course of a week, that's going to elicit a 20% increase in egg production. No, he was saying egg prices spiked last year. And then that's why production was higher, you know, presumably meaning this year. Okay. So that's entirely possible. And again, their data didn't refute it. It couldn't have. And if anything, the projections of the data sources said that it, it was consistent with his story. So that's just you know one example that I kind of walked through and probably beat to death, but just to show you cannot trust these people. And partly why I'm so upset is this, uh, 
lady, Isabella Weber, you know, when this piece ran, she was, you know, so she's a college professor somewhere on her Twitter. She was saying stuff like, uh, I was at a, at a barbecue and some, uh, some creative writing professor who was a male uh, lectured me on the dangers of price control, unaware of my work. Ah, the joys of being a female in academia and getting mansplained too. Right. And so my snarky response, which you may have seen, Jonathan, was to say something like, wow, this is the first time in human history when somebody, you know, without formal economics training spouted off on economics topics as someone with more training. Are you OK? Right. Because that irked me that she was making it sound like this was happening to me because I was a female academic. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm a white heterosexual male. And trust me, people explain economic stuff to me all the time and they don't know what they're talking about. So it's not because you're a woman is because people don't know economics. Okay, well, I'm, I've been ranting for a bit, Jonathan. I will pause there. Is there anything you wanted to say about this uh, Gail Braith and Weber piece beside what you've already said? Uh, well, uh, we're sort of running out of time, but I, I was just thinking about the uh, the mental image of like a price ticker inside the chicken coops since they had that line about high prices did not stimulate America's hens to greater effort. Uh, and so I was just thinking about, you know, price sensitive chickens and how silly that is. Uh, but <laughs> I've actually, I've owned uh, chickens before, um, and uh, recently and also earlier in my life, and uh, there there actually are some things that you can do uh, with it with a given stock of chickens uh, that changes their egg production. So it's not it's not uh, it's not so far fetched to to think that some change in egg prices would actually result in in different decisions by the uh, chicken farmers' inputs to the egg production process, uh, including, you know, changing what's inside the feed, uh, different things that you could do to keep the chickens healthier, access to sunlight, all, all of those sorts of things. So, so even, even with a given set of chickens, there are some things that you can do and it's, it's very, uh, it's not controversial to think that some change in egg prices would, al would allow you to change the mix of, of inputs to what you're giving the chickens and what you're allowing the chickens to do that would change their, their egg production. So indirectly, maybe chickens are price sensitive, <laughs> their egg productivity. Yeah. So just to make sure that people at home aren't getting mixed up. Right. So Jonathan and I are focusing on two different margins, I guess that, yeah, I was saying in given operations, it's typical, you know, that the feedback I was getting to say, yeah, given hen is cranking out eggs and then there's a cycle and yes, the frequency of egg production does start to diminish but normally they're taken out of production before the last egg pops out of them, right? And and so on the margin, yeah, if the economics, if, if egg prices spiked, you would leave them in production for longer. And then Jonathan, it sounds like you're saying even, you know, for a given length of time, the amount of eggs that comes out of a given hen can be higher or lower depending on decisions and, you know, practices that the farmer puts in place. So the, the other thing that I looked at, uh, and maybe this is uh, something that we can link in the show notes of for, for people to read about, uh, is they made this claim about uh, JFK's, uh, pr the pressure that he applied on U.S. Steel to make them go back on a price increase. That, yeah, here, that, let me yeah let me just read that, and then I'll have you comment, sure. John. So they say, in, 19, in 1962, then-President John F. Kennedy had achieved nationwide wage and price restraint with guidelines accepted by the most powerful trade unions in steel, automobiles, and rubber. Roger... Oh, that's blah. The head of U.S. Steel busted the deal with a major price hike. Kennedy forced him to back down. Kennedy was right about that, and Harris is right about going after price gouging now. So yeah, so it's kind of so, hard to attack them when they just said Kennedy was right. I'm like, okay, <laughs> but what do you have to say? So, so there's this uh, uh, great uh, uh, contribution by uh, William Peterson in a book called, uh, let's see, um, Central Planning and Neo Mercantilism. Um, and he's actually talking about this very episode, and he's responding to this this other uh, economist, uh, Gardner Means, uh, who was he he was making a lot of the same claims that you know the Elizabeth Warren, uh, Robert Reich are make today, saying that it's corporate consolidation and corporate administered prices that. Uh, uh, that diminish competition and harm the consumer and also lead to to price inflation. Um, and so it, this is a great article and there's a PDF available through the uh, Mises Institute's website. Uh, so we can link to that book. And then the, the chapter is it's chapter nine, Steel Price Administration, Myth and Reality. And what uh, Peterson does is he goes through all of the arguments uh, and shows that there's, first of all, it doesn't make sense in theory what what's what's being said by means 
uh, about consolidation within the steel industry and the relationship between uh, the cost of inputs and the price of outputs. And it also doesn't make sense to say that uh, that the price of steel is he he calls it a, a bellwether. It doesn't make sense to say that that if you look at the history of it, uh, there there really isn't that link that they're trying to claim that if the price of steel goes up, then that's going to cause general price increases throughout the rest of the economy. Uh, so so he attacks that, but also uh, there's just a few tidbits in there about this uh, this episode with Kennedy and U.S. Steel, uh, and it turns out that it wasn't really that Kennedy forced him to, to back down. They, they did. So they announced it was like a three and a half percent increase uh, in the price of steel. And then they later after Kennedy wrote, he, he wrote something about how this is unconscionable. They shouldn't do this. But it turns out that what Kennedy was doing was he was actually a part of a general sort of rejection of this price increase. Uh, and so the, the the price increase was very unpopular. And I think U.S. Steel realized that. And so then they came back down um, on the price. They reversed that. Uh, a lot of people said that they did it in a in a bad way. They didn't announce it ahead of time. They, d- they didn't get uh, other they didn't give other businesses enough notice ahead of time that prices were increasing. And so because of that, U.S. Steel went back on it and, and increased prices later uh, after after an announcement. So it's it's not the case that uh, that that Kennedy forced him to back down. There was this there was a broader rejection uh, among in the public about the increase in prices. And he also points out that uh, what Kennedy had done with the uh, unions and, and the wage and price guidelines earlier actually served to increase the cost of steel production. And they didn't increase prices back then. And so at this point, they were trying to catch up. So that there was this uh, diminished production of steel because of those increased costs. And then finally, they came around to increasing the price. They did it all of a sudden without notice. People rejected, including Kennedy writing about it. And so then they then they reversed it. So it's it's this this is not what Harris is proposing is what I'm trying to say. This is not the same thing as a ban on price gouging. This was Kennedy was one of many people in the United States that were saying U.S. Steel shouldn't be increasing their prices, and so then they went back on it uh, and and later increased their prices in a in a way that's uh, that's better PR, I guess. Uh, it's not the case that Kennedy cracked down. He didn't uh, write a new law. He didn't ban this price increase, which is exactly what Harris is proposing. Yeah. Also, too, I mean, it's. Um as far as historical averages and whatnot, the the Fed was inflating more in the post-war era, you know, than they had historically. You know, now we're on the the Bretton Woods system and whatnot. So again, what, they're just taking it as a as a fact of nature. Yeah, with JFK's in office, and all of a sudden there's all these pr- you know wage and price hikes, and he was trying to contain it all, and then U.S. Steel was doing the anti-social thing and not going along. It just raises the question. How come he was facing that situation in the first place? And again, if you looked at various metrics, you would see, well, it's because, you know, government deficit spending and, you know, Fed accommodation were higher in that period than they, you know, were in 1923, for example, right? So that's not shocking that it seemed like there was this upward pressure on prices all of a sudden. Um, Very quickly here, Jonathan. It occurs to me, maybe just as the last thing, you had said something earlier is a sort of line about ethics. And I think there's, if like if I were a, a local convenience store owner, right, and I'm keeping my stockpile, and if the if there's a natural disaster and all of a sudden, you know, the market clearing price of bottled water and other essential items, batteries and whatnot spikes, I think what I would do is, you know, charge what the market would bear but then with my, quote, windfall profits, if I knew they really were a windfall, that it's not that I was carrying extra capacity on the off chance that there was going to be a situation and I knew my profit margin would be higher, I would you know, still charge the high price for the rationing element, but then I would donate you know, to some local charity that was like handing out bottled water to families that really needed it or something. You know what I mean? Like, that, like that's a much more balanced approach rather than just sort of giving the bonanza to the first few people that come into your store and letting them clear the shelves, right? That that's, that's a better way of handling it. But in general, I am, I would not say that, Oh, any store owner who pockets those profits is doing a bad thing because going in, you know, ahead of time, like how do store owners decide how much inventory to carry? And like, you know, something like, well, gee, we got to get a limited amount of warehouse space or we first have to decide how much 
you know, how big is the warehouse going to be or how much of it are we going to rent and whatnot and to decide, do we want to have more cases of water? Do we want to have more tuna fish, whatnot? All these things are economic decisions made on the margin. And so if you know, especially if you're in a region that's prone to disasters like this, like if it's, you know, a coastal town that gets hit with hurricanes a lot, then your equilibrium amount of inventory you carry of those essentials is going to be higher if you know that, oh yeah, there's a chance the price might spike and then I'm going to charge that price and pocket it. Like that's going to allow you to carry more inventory. So it's not just a fact of nature how much bottled water is in the city physically when the disaster strikes. That's partly due to decisions that have been made in the past with people anticipating market conditions. And so if they just know in our area, nope, the attorney general would crack down on you, well, then there's going to be less water on hand when the disaster strikes. And if that's what people want, because they're going to feel that it's fairer, even though nobody has any water, okay, but... I'm just saying, so to me, I don't know if you have any last thoughts on that, Jonathan, in terms of, you know, as a Christian concerned about the plight of the unfortunate, there's a way to thread that needle that you're allowed to donate money to charitable organizations that are giving, you know, handing out food and medical supplies in a crisis. And how do you come up with that? It's partly by charging the market clearing price. Yeah. When I said that earlier, I wasn't trying to say that there's an ethical case so like on grounds of morality, there's a case for price controls. I wasn't trying to say that. So like economics says one thing, but you know, if we mm -hmm. think about this in an ethical sort of way, then there's, there leads to a different conclusion. I absolutely agree with you that the, 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 uh, the, the best thing for human welfare. Uh, and so like, if you want to think about it on consequentialist grounds, the best thing possible is for, for prices to be negotiated based on voluntary exchange which means allowing so-called price gouging. Uh, what, what I was referring to there is, is um, so since you mentioned Christian ethics, I was thinking about ethics from the viewpoint of the person's motivations. So if you, mm -hmm. if you think about uh, like, I mean, it's, it's very, it's very possible. In fact, I'm sure this has happened that somebody has bad motivations when they are, um, when they're increasing their prices, or maybe they're even a little bit happy that this crisis has emerged. And so now they can sell something at a much higher price uh, than if there wasn't a crisis. But but my point was to say that even in that case, you're, you're forcing the, if you allow market prices to prevail, you're sort of forcing the this greedy person, this bad person to behave in a way that is socially beneficial. So like the, the market system and the, the price system it, it, it works in such a way that no matter what that person's motivations are, you still get this this great outcome, which is economizing the resource, attracting more supply to the region, uh, less waste, and also uh, you know safer markets because people don't have to resort to black markets to get the things that they want and need. So even in the case where we say that there there's a group of people out there who who like exploiting people in these crisis situations, e even even if you make that allowance, it still makes sense to not have price controls. What the merchants intended for greed, God uses for good. That's and right. in fact, even in that classic, you know, Old Testament story, it's Joseph ended up, you know, stockpiling food during the years of plenty to make sure people didn't <laughs> starve during the years of famine. And so say folks that yes, the, uh, and by the way, this is a little pet peeve of my, economists have changed Adam Smith did not say people are led as if by an invisible hand. He said people are led by an invisible hand, right? And so him being a man of faith, you know, I think he was saying just to underscore what Jonathan's point is that, yes, uh, the, the way our world works is that even if people are motivated by base uh, desires and, you know, greed and so forth, the market economy transforms that so that they end up serving uh, humanity. Well, that's a good place to end. Jonathan, thanks as always for your time and your insights. Thanks for having me, Bob. Thanks everybody for tuning in. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.